Welcome to the Aaron Harbor Show. This is part two of our special two-part series with Congressman Steve King. Steve, again, great having you. I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Aaron. My pleasure. Okay, so uh, uh, I let you go into depth on uh, the subjects we discussed in part one, especially on illegal immigration and DACA kids and all that. So this is going to be a rapid fire program. Okay. Uh, which means I have to be responsible for asking short questions as well. <laughs> with short answers. <laughs> and you get, you get the short answers. Okay. Uh, number one, we'll start off with, if you could change one thing about President Trump, what would it be? And I know you know the president pretty well. <laughs> um, actually, the main thing is no DACA amnesty. That'd be the one thing. Otherwise, I think he's kept every promise that he could keep, keep all along the way. The whiteboards in the war room had check marks behind all those presidential campaign promises, and that's the one that is at risk of being lost. So other than that, um, I'm, I say we've got a tiger by the tail. And uh, excuse me, I've, I hear other people say that. I've, I say it the other way around, that we're riding a tiger. And it's kind of hard to get off. You might get bit. Yeah. So, but it's an exciting time. <laughs> all right, great. All right, if you could get one bill passed in the House and Senate, uh, and signed by the president. Anything you wanted, what would it be? Heartbeat bill, right here on my lapel. And uh, this, the heartbeat bill says this, that, that before an abortionist can conduct his trade, he must first check for a heartbeat. If the heartbeat can be, can be detected, the baby is protected. And uh, I have 171 signatures on it, 162 national organizations or leaders that support it. And once we get that bill out of the house, uh, the Senate's going to be a little harder. The president will sign it. And by then, I think we have a new appointment to the Supreme Court. So that's number one, Aaron. Okay, good to know. All right, uh, trade, free trade. Uh, certainly the president has been upsetting uh, some of our best trading partners. Uh, and meanwhile, focusing on trying to make uh, relations better with China, who he had, of course, uh, criticized greatly, uh, and North Korea, of course, with the progress he's made there literally single-handedly which I think has surprised a lot of people. Uh, but on free trade, he certainly has taken a position that a lot of American companies, including a lot of farmers in your state, are unhappy about. Uh, what's your take on that, and do you think he needs to be uh, turned around on that issue? Well, um, he and I have talked about this too, and I'm a free trader, and uh, he wants to have fair trade, so I'll say, okay, I'm a smart trader then. Let's be smart traders. But, um, you know, we've got such a trade deficit uh, going on. And with China, the thing even worse than that is the, the Chinese piracy of intellectual property. And that number, the president pegged at $300 billion a year. There are other numbers that go all the way to $600 billion a year. And I believe that if we could get that Chinese piracy fixed, that we'd, this, the trade issue would be close to resolved, if not resolved. But he's playing at a multifaceted level. Um, the tariff that he put on for everybody was on China and Mexico first, then he took it off, then he put it on. Um, he's playing some strategic negotiating games with all of this. One thing that is, should be injected into this, and the White House is looking at it, it's a bill that I wrote about a dozen years ago from China when I went there to tell them what I thought about them stealing our intellectual property. And I wrote a bill that said, direct the trade, build, write a bill that directs the U.S. Trade Representative to conduct a study to determine the value of all intellectual property, for U.S. intellectual property that is pirated by the Chinese, put a duty on all products coming from China in amount equivalent to recover that loss, plus an administrative fee, and distribute it to the rightful property rights owners. Had we passed that bill that dozen years ago, we wouldn't have this problem with China today. That's one of those self-actuating, self-correcting pieces of legislation, and I'm hopeful that we get that done. Well, and I think the uh, even bigger problem isn't the pirated technology, it's the fact that the Chinese require American companies to disclose their technology as part of trade deals and part of having the opportunity to operate, which strikes me as an extraordinarily unreasonable demand. But we never should have capitulated to that in the first place. And businesses will make that accommodation because they think the profit potential's there, it makes it worth it. Uh, the intellectual property that they have is precious to this country too and so some of our national security is compromised and the Chinese will infuse themselves into our American companies and their their intellectual base will go will go with it and I have actually know of a company that uh, was robbed of 4.8 billion dollars of intellectual value and um, and the way they kept their tied cybersecurity tight enough that it didn't get stolen by the Chinese until the Chinese 
paid one of their workers two million dollars that had it in his head and he walked out of that company for two million and the Chinese have that. So it is very complex but we don't pay enough attention to it and I hope the DOD is. That's Department of Defense. Right. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll see about that. Uh, it doesn't seem that we're making much progress on that front. We'll see what happens over the course of the, the coming year. Mm -hmm. How do you, I mean, certainly you're identified, uh, to put it politely, on the right side of the political aisle, uh, but you, you know your colleagues on the left as well. What, what can you do to promote uh, civil dialogue between the right and the left? Oh, you know, I just... Um, I just make friends with them, and some of them I, I razz them mercilessly, and they give it right back to me. Uh, just thinking about some of that, when Dennis Kucinich was, was in Congress, he was the best friend I had on that side. He's still a friend today, and we talk on the phone or in other ways we meet once in a while. Um, Henry Cuellar is a good friend out of Texas, and he's a good friend to everybody on our side, not only me. And uh, Maxine Waters and I have served on the same committee for 16 years, and we've gone at it hammer and tongs in the committee, but you know, she'll give me a hug in the elevator and we have a good chat. So uh, you just have to treat people as, treat, as people, and you can't get bogged down in, in anger and frustration about these issues beyond what's necessary to do our jobs, and then we're just people after that, and, and, and it's, those relationships have been there for me, and I'm sure there are people that don't like me. There are a couple of them I can think of that will look at their shoes if we're the only two in the elevator, but they have to carry that, I don't. All right, you were, you were named by The Atlantic as America's worst congressman. <laughs> How did you win that accolade? Well, I don't really know. I don't think I bothered to read the article, but, <laughs> uh, so maybe they didn't attract me enough with uh, The Atlantic, but uh, America's worst congressman, do you remember any of the criteria? I, I don't. Well, my, my guess is that depending on what criteria you pick, there, there could be a lot of people uh, in that group, especially depending on what your perspective is. Well, and, and there's been uh, somebody out there said Steve King never passes a bill. And so that may be a part of what their criteria is. And uh, so I don't keep score that way, but we went back and looked. And last summer, there was um, one, one day in one 24 hour and six minute period. I managed four of my bills and it passed off the floor of the house in 24 hours and six minutes. So I don't know if anybody's beat that record. The, I introduced the first Obamacare repeal uh, language. I mean, I own that language in Congress. The Democrats say that it's passed 44 times. The biggest bill passed 44 times and no one has passed more or a higher percentage of amendments than I have. So um, maybe I'm the worst for some other reason, but it won't be for lack of production or trying. And by the way, for a long time, and maybe not still true, but uh, the last time my staff checked that I had more words in the congressional record than anybody else. So maybe they got tired of listening to me. All right, yeah, I'm not sure if I, I'm not sure if I would brag about that. All right, <laughs> they talk, said it should be classified themselves, as my staff said. <laughs> let's talk about, you know, we had, we had talked about immigration uh, a lot in the first show. Let's talk about the concepts. When, we'll take a quick break, but when we come back, about assimilation versus multiculturalism. I'd like your take on that. All right, we're going to take a break. We'll be right back with Steve King in just a moment. For information on how to help promote civil and mutually respectful discourse and support expansion of the distribution of our programs, please email info at harbortv.com. I'm Aaron Harbor, host of The Aaron Harbor Show. You can follow the show on Twitter for instant notification of new episodes, live event invitations, outtakes, and behind the scene photos. And tweet us your topic and guest suggestions today. The Rex Al Broadcaster of the Year Award recognizes an individual who through leadership, skill, and dedication is advancing the broadcast industry in our state and our nation. Tonight, we honor Aaron Harbor. Aaron has uh, worked extensively in the media as a host, producer, political and economic commentator and columnist. Today, the Aaron Harbor Show is the focus of his media involvement. Aaron, it is a privilege to present you with the Rex Howe Broadcaster of the Year Award. Congratulations. Just make journalism great again. 
The Aaron Harbour Show may be viewed 24-7 at no charge from any location in the world at harbortv.com. Welcome back to the show. I'm with Congressman Steve King. All right, we're joking about we need, we're going to do four shows. We're not going to do four shows. Okay, I mentioned uh, assimilation versus multiculturalism. So give me a quick take on that and your concerns. Well, I, I think we hear this constantly. Diversity is our strength. Diversity is our strength. And I look around through history and around the globe, and I try to find where diversity is actually the strength. And I don't think people have analyzed that at all. I mean, I'd ask somebody like Victor Davis Hanson, who knows a lot about this, about, the, about this, or maybe Thomas Sowell, and I think they're going to agree with me that it's not diversity that is our strength, but it's, it's assimilation that is the glue that binds together the diversity, and then it becomes strong, kind of like laminated wood products are. But when, when you see, and let's see, Tom, Sowell wrote about how any society that's ever accentuated the differences really had a lot of trouble holding together. We accentuate the differences too much in this society. We need to get back to Martin Luther King Jr. and content of character and stop seeing people by some category other than somebody created in God's image and then measure that character and bind ourselves together with common language, common cause, common principles, common sense of history and pulling together in the same harness. And, but, but can't you have your cake and eat it too in the sense that you certainly can have diversity and the kind of diversity we have, people from different countries, people uh, under freedom, our freedoms of religion, that you can have you know, different religions. Uh, you can certainly have all those differences and, and each of those backgrounds may bring something different. Personally, I'm excited about the different food types that, that different <laughs> cultures bring. Yeah, me but, too. But you can do that, but still have everybody assimilated. I mean, everyone in terms of being a U.S. citizen, knowing the Constitution, caring about their country, contributing to, to their communities, uh, all the values that I think are American values without being prejudiced towards any type of race or religion or culture or whatever. Yeah. Why can't we have both? We did at one time had our cake and ate it too with regard to the way you described it. And we brought people from all over, every donor civilization in the world uh, sent people here and we welcomed them and they did, they embraced our language, they embraced the American culture, and they didn't even raise their children to, to know where they came from. I mean, I, I grew up with kids in my class that didn't know if their family was German or Irish or Norwegian or whatever. And, uh, but I think they lost something in that. I think they should have hung on to a knowledge of the history of the family and that heritage. But we've, worked, we've seen this society work against this assimilation. And for example, when I was first elected to office, I, I decided, okay, even though they didn't vote for me, I'm gonna talk to all the minority groups and let them know, you have a voice and I wanna hear it. So I called a meeting and there were 14 representatives in there of multiple minority groups. And I did a, like a one minute opening. I listened to them for 89 minutes, meeting was over. I said, I don't have time to explain what I think here, but I'm gonna ask you one thing. Get up in the front of your chair, so you're ready to react. I'm gonna say one word, and I want, I want you to react in a way that I know what you think of that, because I don't have time to listen to you all now. And so they got up in the front of their chairs, and I said, assimilation. And they all went simultaneously, oh no, we don't need any assimilation. They all rejected it, everyone did. And, that, and I've seen that over and over again, where we've gotta look at what it is to be an American and pull ourselves together. And a common language is the most powerful, unifying force there is all throughout all of human history. Oh, no question. Everyone needs to know English. There's, there's, I, don't think, I, I don't think there's disagreement on that. Clearly, that's not always happening. All right, I'm going to jump into, we talked about free trade. Uh, I'm going to criticize you for supporting an ethanol mandate in fuels. I think the scientific research, and you're a fact-based guy, has shown that ethanol is bad for engines. The energy, net energy result of using ethanol is negative. The climate change impacts are negative. It causes, you're, you're allocating corn, and you and I love corn and corn products. I grow corn on my farm where I live at times. Uh, a lot of that has been 40, up to 40% diverted to ethanol instead of food. Um, a 25 gallon tank of just pure ethanol is, requires something like 450 pounds of corn, which is equal in some countries to the caloric equivalent of food for a year. 
is it time to repeal the ethanol mandate? <laughs> is, it time, is it time to get Aaron. the federal government out of our gasoline tanks? It sounds to me like you've been talking to the petroleum lobby. <laughs> but I would say first to the petroleum lobby, if I am speaking to them. You're not. You're not. <laughs> that it takes more energy to crack a gallon of gasoline out of a barrel of crude oil than it does to produce a gallon of ethanol out of a bushel of corn. And that's just a fact. And, and so, and, 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 you know, and furthermore, we, we, take, we take corn, and which has, there's three components in corn, three major components. There's starch, there's, 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 there's a protein, and then there's CO2. And if you feed it to cattle, the, the CO2 goes out into the atmosphere eventually anyway, and we are a starch-rich and protein-poor world. That's why they're now just starting to eat meat in Asia in, a, in a significant numbers. So we take the starch out of that corn and we convert that into ethanol. And we can compete with petroleum on this. It's only, a, the, 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 you say, a mandate, and it's, it's this, that we blend enough in it that, that requires market access. Now, what we want to do is just eliminate all of that and let the petroleum industry compete against the ethanol industry and let the blend go from E10 to E15 to E 2030 on up to E85. And when I pull into the pump today and I, and I put in E10 next to the regular gasoline, I'll have to say not today, but I'm looking back at my memory a month or so, 40 cents cheaper is how much that ethanol puts that gallon of gas for me. So I burn it in everything. It doesn't ruin any of the engines I've got, not in my boat, not in my chainsaw, not in my weed eater, and not in my lawnmower, which has been, I'm, I've been running the same lawnmower for 20 years, believe it or not. I'm a conservative after all. So um, I, I wish I could keep a lawnmower <laughs> for working for 20 years. <laughs> and, and then, um, you know, as far as food is concerned, um, just to give you an example, there are two ears of corn down in my man cave at home. And they all, they look about the same. The one ear on that nail is an 1848 open pollinated variety that the pioneers planted. Iowa State, by the way, kept that number alive and working for, since 1848. That corn did 15 to 25 bushel to the acre. That was all the yield it got. The ear of corn right above that is out of the 2015 crop, triple stack hybrid with the technology we have now. It, it yielded 232 bushels to the acre over the scale. So 10 times the corn we used to raise is what we do now on a single acre. And we're going out, we're gonna add another, I'll say another 30 or 40 percent to that, according to Monsanto, before we have to reset and figure out what'll happen. So what happens if we don't put this into ethanol? We'll have another farm crisis that'll just, the economy, the economy will collapse. We're competing with petroleum. If you, if you lock ethanol out of the marketplace, what you've created then is a petroleum mandate for America. And what we wanted to do was provide other options for energy and make America less dependent on foreign oil. Today we're exporting crude oil. I voted for that bill, by the way. We're exporting crude oil partly because we're supplementing that gasoline with a product that is renewable. And by the way, to conclude this, every time you add ethanol to gasoline, you are increasing the octane and decreasing the toxic tailpipe emissions. All right, well, I think the, the other argument is that you're actually reducing the octane in terms of the, the energy efficiency of gasoline with ethanol, but- You lose we, a little mileage. We, it may, right, it, we, it may be, uh, both our arguments may be moot <laughs> if everybody ends up driving electric vehicles anyway, so. <laughs> they so. might, we'll generate that electricity <laughs> with coal and start it all over again. <laughs> all right, all right, we're gonna come back and wrap up with Steve King in just a moment. For information on how to help promote civil and mutually respectful discourse and support expansion of the distribution of our programs, please email info at harbortv.com. Hi, I'm Aaron. Rex Howe Broadcaster of the Year Award recognizes because an I've individual who, through leadership, skill, and dedication, is advancing the broadcast industry in our, in our state and our nation. Broadcast outlets. Tonight, it's we honor to Aaron Harbor. Whether we do them here in Denver or go to places such as Aspen, Washington, D.C., Aaron or even Iraq. has uh, worked is, extensively in the media as a host, producer, political, and economic commentator, and columnist. Today, the Aaron Harbor Show is the focus of his media involvement. Aaron, it is a privilege to present you with the Rex Howe Broadcaster of the Year Award. Congratulations.
doing the effort as tax exempt public charitable organization. It's promised to dedicate 100% of every Just make journalism great again. Today. I'm Aaron Harbour, host of The Aaron Harbour Show. Find us on Facebook to get all the latest updates, see behind the scene photos, and make comments and ask me questions. You can see episodes before their TV broadcast, so like the show today. Join me and watch The Aaron Harbour Show. Watch The Aaron Harbour Show. Watch The Aaron Harbour Show. Watch the Aaron Harper Show. Watch the Aaron Harper Show. I'm Reverend Jesse Jackson. Watch the Aaron Harper Show and keep hope alive. I'm Aaron Harper, host of the Aaron Harper Show. You can follow the show on Twitter for instant notification of new episodes, live event invitations, outtakes, and behind the scene photos. And tweet us your topic and guest suggestions today. The Aaron Harbour Show may be viewed 24-7 at no charge from any location in the world at harbortv.com. Welcome back to the show again. This is part two of our special two-part series with Congressman Steve King. This is our last segment, so we're, gonna, we're still trying to do rapid fire here, but both of us are failing at it miserably. All right, taxation. You've proposed the fair tax. Yes. Uh, which is a consumption tax. Mm -hmm. is it, uh, does it parallel uh, a VAT, a value-added tax? Um, there, it's, it does not have a value-added tax. It's just the last stop on the consumer, consumer trail. And so, so a retail, like a national sales national tax. National retail sales tax. But in exchange for eliminating the federal income tax. Absolutely. Which and is, all the other taxes. Which, which is the key. So, uh, uh, so I've always been a supporter of a flat tax. Uh, and getting rid of deductions and everything, put it on a postcard, give everybody a $50,000 initial deduction so that you know, if, if someone's earning very little, they don't, they don't have that burden. Uh, of course, the big burden for a lot of people at the lower end of the spectrum are, are the employment taxes. Uh, but that's a separate issue. So get but, rid of But I replace them with my fair tax. Uh, so the fair tax also, what percent would that be? Well, let's see. I've got it. It's been a while since I've had this discussion. Um, <clears throat> we were at, I believe, 20 or 21 percent is what that number worked out to be, and it has that number hasn't been calculated though in probably 10 years. All right. Well, let's say it's 20 percent, but in yeah. exchange, you get rid of the the federal income tax, you get rid of employment taxes, mm -hmm. you get rid of estate taxes, which mm -hmm. are kind of on the way out anyway, thanks to the tax reform bill, yep. uh, which was definitely a good move on that front. Um, uh, in terms of the death tax. So uh, what, what kind of support, are, are you, are you, have, is this something you're really active in still or no? Well, I was, I was very aggressive in it when I first arrived. Uh, John Linder of Georgia was the lead on it. And I went and found him and introduced myself right away. And he's a great friend to this, to this day. Uh, but um, it's gone, you know, once, once we did the tax reform right before Christmas last year, then it's off the table, I think, for now. And I've long said that it's such a good idea, though. Uh, there's, every time I, I call it like, every time I turn the Rubik's Cube of the fair tax, the national sales tax, another way, another way, it looks better and better and better, not worse and worse. The more I learned about it, and, and I actually devised this, there were other people that put it together, and, and they deserve credit, but I devised this from the seat of a bulldozer. And uh, because I'd been audited one too many years in a row by the IRS, and I came to a place where I had to decide, do I borrow the money to pay the tax I, shouldn't, I really don't owe, um, or do I fight them on principle and end up having them break me because of that? And that's one of the very few you times. Paid the t I bet you paid the tax. I paid the tax. Unfortunately, that, unfortunately that's often the smartest move. I, I, used well, to do, I used to have a tax preparation service, and, and what I would tell people, it's not worth the hassle yeah. Uh, because it's just a black hole of time. But when I, when I, when I have to give a whole, let go of a principle, it just it galls me for life. All right, and so, so here's what happened. Uh, after I wrote that check, I went out, climbed in that bulldozer, and the smoke went out the stack and my ears, and I started thinking, how do I get rid of the IRS? I came to the fair tax. All right, well, you still need to work on that. We'll, we'll figure out. You need to talk to the president. Balanced budget. Okay, I'm going to be really critical of Republicans. Most Republicans I know are for a balanced budget, for a balanced budget amendment. Well, the Republicans control the House, the Senate, uh, the White House. Why doesn't the Republican Party in the Congress, and of course the House is where 
all uh, the financial bills are supposed to originate. I mean, there have been some workarounds, as you and I both know, yeah, yeah. in the Senate on occasion. Why doesn't the House propose a balanced budget? Well, we did. In fact, we voted a balanced budget amendment. Um, so well, go, no, not a balanced budget amendment. Uh, I'm saying a balanced budget propose itself. a balanced budget. Well, uh, we, um, when we have, uh, but not balanced in that year, but a budget that balances in a matter of time. When I first came to Congress, I went to the budget chairman, which was Jim Nussel from Iowa, and I said, where's our balanced budget? He said, we can't balance the budget. We're ramping up TSA. We're already at war in Afghanistan. We're getting ready to go to war in Iraq. Can't balance it. I said, we got to. And so I set about trying to write a balanced budget. And I'd only been there a few weeks, and I actually didn't get it done. I could do it now overnight. Uh, but I could do it now on a napkin. Yeah. So yeah, all right, we'll, right. we're running out we of time. We'll talk about that. Let's jump into health care. I know you've right. been, as you mentioned, leading proponent of appealing Obamacare. Uh, you've proposed, in essence, kind of a, which is really fascinating to me, and, but correct me if I'm wrong. My understanding is uh, you've, you've always proposed uh, essentially a public option and say people should be able to, there should be a free market system, uh, we should have full competition, uh, but uh, people should be able to buy into Medicare. Is that still your perspective? Well, Do I have that I, right? I don't or not? recall that I've have taken that public position that people should be able to buy into Medicare. I know that others have done that, but my, my view is this that our health insurance system worked best when it was only states that ran health insurance. And that went on all the way till March 23rd through 2010, which is the Obama signature on Obamacare. The federal government should get out and let the states run the health insurance, but we need to repeal the component of McCarran-Ferguson that, that allows the states to set up health insurance monopolies so that individuals can buy health insurance across state lines then they can go with catastrophic policies. We need one full 100% deductibility of everybody's health insurance premium. There's, um, it needs to be treated like it's a business expense. It is for companies. It needs to be for ma and pa. And then, uh, then also... Well, well, it has been, but of course now with higher uh, limits on, on deductions, on standard deductions, for the vast majority of people, that's lost out. But, but on your website it says, uh, that uh, by giving those under 55 the choice of joining traditional Medicare or using Medicare dollars to buy a private health insurance plan. So uh, uh, that, that appears to be saying you, have, it, you don't have a number of what it would cost per person, but that's saying I'm going to give you Medicare as an option if you're under 55. Well, okay, this, this, would, be, um, <clears throat> this would be part of, I think, somebody else's proposal about how they were going to expand it that way. But I'll just tell you the straightest answer is, I haven't read that. If I did, I read it a long time ago. Okay. So if that's right. on my well, website. I thought it was a great idea. I'll we'll probably read it idea. about tomorrow okay. and see you, if I You, if I, you better, because I'm going to ask it. you about it next time. <laughs> but, but that struck me as a great idea, because it essentially creates a public option. Democrats should go for that. And in exchange, you could bargain uh, get, and get all, get, get, basically shut down Obamacare. Uh, completely. I would think that'd be a phenomenal political trade that, okay, we're going to get rid of Obamacare, but everybody has the right to, uh, it has an option, not only with the private insurance policies, going across state lines. Of course, companies, insurance companies can sell property, uh, sell insurance policies across state lines now if they want. They just have to uh, apply within each state to do it. Yeah, and uh, then they have to meet all of the guidelines and all of the specifications for that, that have been lobbied for by the resident health insurance company, which is usually Wellmark, who has a 100% market share mission statement. And uh, they want a full monopoly in the states they're in, and they say so. Alabama was 90% Wellmark. Well, that's capitalism. You uh, always want a monopoly it's capitalism in capitalism. with a political twist, though. Right. I mean, if and you, if and you if can, you repeal if, McCarran-Ferguson, then you can just go out of Alabama and go buy your insurance out of Arizona or Kentucky. One of the numbers that we had in 2009 Yeah, but if you, was, buy, your, if you buy your insurance out of another state, that state is still going to have to... A pro you're going to have to have a doctor network, a hospital That's right. network. They so. have to be willing to pay the costs of the state where you reside. Right. right. And, the, and the premiums would be set accordingly. Right. And they vary. So, so I mean, so they, they can do that now. I mean, you can, you know, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, Anthem, whatever, uh, United Healthcare, they can go to any state they want and sell a policy. But like you said. Within the terms of the state that's right, written them. That's right. But and you're for states' rights, so hey. Uh, that's, I'm not for state monopolies, though. So <laughs> thank you, Aaron. <laughs> All right. You did a great job, Steve. That was Congressman Steve King. You know he's going to be back on the show again. I'm Aaron Harbor. Make sure you watch part one and part two of the series. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.
please contact us. We want to hear from you. And thanks for watching.